Every species is faced with challenges presented by the environment they live in. The ability of a species or population to adapt to changes in the environment is predicated on their ability to alter or change the functions performed by their genomes. When we observe species or populations of organisms within a species performing new functions compared to ancestral generations, we have to ask ourselves, where did these organisms derive the capacity to do task X if their ancestors did not previously exhibit such an ability? Put another way, what is the origin of this innovation? And more specifically, since these new abilities are likely the expression of their genetic code, we might ask what changes could have occurred to these organisms' genomes to have given them the capacity to perform new tasks, which are new traits. Let's look at one mechanism by which the genome can generate innovations, gene duplication and reassignment. Before we dig into that, let me just give you a brief outline of what I would like to cover in this particular uh, talk. First, we want to identify a few mechanisms by which new gene functions can arrive in organisms. So I don't want to just talk about uh, gene duplication. I want to give you a, a broader sense that there are multiple mechanisms that have been proposed for how uh, novelty or innovation can arise in genomes. Uh, and those are just going to be a brief look at some of those. Then we'll specifically talk about one of those, which is gene duplication. So how does this particular mechanism work? And then we want to dig into, and this is where the really the meat of this talk will be, and that is we want to look at one specific example of gene duplication. And that is look at amylase genes, which, are, which is the gene that breaks down starch. Uh, if you are eating starch in your diet, you have a gene that produces an uh, enzyme called amylase that helps you break down that starch and digest it. Um, so amylase genes have been duplicated, or at least I hope to show you or convince you that amylase genes have been duplicated in some organisms, and they have been reassigned new functions in those organisms over time. All right, so that's our goal here. Let's get started. So how do organisms generate innovations? Um, specifically, how can a new function for a gene be formed? If genes have particular tasks and jobs that they do, right? Genes are pieces of coding sequence or DNA code that code for particular responsibilities or functions, right? Many of them producing enzymes and enzymes are responsible for performing uh, biochemical or biochemistry tasks, right? Putting together, taking apart uh, other molecules. Um, and the further question you could ask is, well, if, if all these genes perform really important functions and in order for an organism to, be, um, to maintain itself, it needs all these different genes functioning and doing what they're supposed to be doing, how then can you uh, change one gene's function into a different function, all right? adapt a gene for a different function over time if the whole time that it's... A, trying to adapt to a, a new environment and give it, an organism a new property, a new task, a new uh, capacity, how can it do that while still performing the old function? Um, there's a, a variety of different mechanisms that have been proposed and observed in nature uh, for how genomes uh, generate novel genetic information and basically make new genes, right? That's, that's the central question here is how do organisms make new genes or new programs, uh, which give them new functions, right? The, or gives the organism a new function, potentially a new function that's important in a new environment, allowing it to adapt to that environment. So there are four main uh, methods or mechanisms that have been proposed, and this talk isn't uh, meant to explain all four of those. We're only going to talk about one, which is the second one, but I thought I would just mention the four, and if that piques your interest, I have talked about one of the others before, and I'll probably talk about this first one, promiscuous proteins, in the future, uh, but let's just quickly go through those four. Um, promiscuous proteins, those are proteins capable of carrying out more than one function. Not every single gene or every single protein has a single function. Uh, 
some have dual functions. They might have one function that's far more important than another function. But uh, you can think of them as being sloppy enzymes, uh, enzymes that uh, mostly perform one task, but biochemistry is not always as clean as we sometimes make it out to be in a, <laughs> in a general biology class. And um, they can also catalyze other reactions at the same time. There's also the fact that you can splice up the gene in different ways. So you can have different mutations that then cause the gene to be put or the protein to be put together in different ways, maybe in different tissues. And that allows the same genetic sequence to be used for multiple function, multiple different parts of the body. Um, I don't want to get into all that. All right. That's that's kind of a different topic than the main one we're going to address today. The one we're going to talk about is the second method of innovating, and that would be gene duplication, which also then may lead to what's called gene recruitment. Um, so this is what happens when you when you duplicate a gene in the genome. So you have the genetic information for the genetic code, right, for a gene whose responsibility is to make a particular product that does some particular function in a cell. If you copy that code, then you have two copies of the code. Uh, for that particular gene. And when you have two copies, then one of those copies may continue to perform the function that it originally uh, was performing, right? And maybe that's a really crucial function for the organism. Uh, and so this goes back to our original uh, part of our original question, which is how would you, if a gene is really important, how can you switch its function to something else without damaging the organism in the, in the meantime? Well, if you've copied the gene, one of the genes can continue to do what it was always doing, and the other gene then is freed up, or the other genetic sequence is now freed up to potentially be altered, and in that alteration process, take on new functions. And so gradually, or sometimes not so gradually, a gene might suddenly have a whole new property or new function as a result. So both genes might perform the same function, but maybe one of those genes was already what we call promiscuous. So some of these mechanisms are, are combined with each other. Promiscuous meaning that that enzyme already could uh, metabolize two, you know, perform two different functions. One, it was doing 95% of the time, and the other thing was 5% of the time. It wasn't really necessarily an important task. But now that you copied the gene and you have two copies of it, one of them can continue to do its primary function. The other one then can say can have a mutation or accumulate mutations that increase their ability to do that secondary function. The thing that they were only doing 5% of the time before and now they're doing 10% of the time and now they're doing 50% of the time. And you see what's gonna happen over time, they might be doing that other function, right? Doing that other metabolic function 75% of the time. And effectively what you have now is you have two genes doing two different functions at that point. So you start with one doing one primary function. You end up with two genes with two different functions. That's the result of the organism then, what we call recruiting that genetic sequence, which is now free to change and adapt because it can adapt because you still have the backup version of the gene that's doing its primary function. All right, we're going to dig into this a lot because I'm going to give an example of this, and we're going to go through some literature and talk about um, where we see this happening. Oh, I forgot I had a, I had a figure that, that uh, <laughs> you know, illustrates this. So you have the original gene, the gene gets duplicated, so now you have a second version of that, of that same gene. So it's the same, originally it's, it, when it first happens, you have the same exact sequence, and you have, so you do have a duplicated gene. And there are different things that can happen. It could just lose its function, and that happens very frequently. There might be a mutation that knocks out the function of the second gene, but the organism is like, I don't care because I still have a functioning version, the original version. Uh, the other thing that can happen is we just said it could gain function. It could maintain the same function for a long time uh, as well. Um, so it could gain a new function uh, for that particular gene, and that's what we're most interested in illustrating uh, here. All right, third method of innovating would be horizontal gene transfer. Um, that's where genetic material is moved horizontally versus vertically. In other words, I uh, give my genetic information to my children. That's vertical inheritance. Horizontal transfer of information would be like I'm giving some of my genetic information to 
you out there, right? Horizontally, somehow I'm transferring some of my genetic information to you. Um, and in this way, organisms can pick up uh, genetic information from other organisms and integrate it into themselves and therefore derive new functions, new novel functions for themselves. They're not necessarily novel with respect to the, in, the existence of that capacity because it existed in another organism, but maybe in that organism's lineage or that species' lineage, that particular ability never existed until it was transferred into that lineage and suddenly now they have that capacity. Well, I've done an entire talk on this particular form of innovating. Uh, and so you can look this up and I'll, maybe I'll remember to put a link uh, under this video. Can new genetic information be gained by an organism? And I was specifically talking about horizontal gene transfer and I provide a particular example of a fungus that picks up genes from bacteria and then gains a new ability to do a biosynthetic process that no other fungus uh, can is able to do. Uh, at least all of its relatives can't do. And so that's the result of horizontal gene transfer. The fourth method is really the most intriguing and has the potential to possibly be the most important. Uh, and yet it's probably the last one that's uh, been identified or uh, I guess actually uh, it's, it's hard to, uh, uh, let's put it this way, it, it's been difficult to demonstrate it, how it happens in nature. But now that we're able to sequence so many genomes uh, and our, our capacity for doing a very sophisticated uh, biomolecular studies in the lab has allowed us to now see how uh, this fourth method of innovating could occur. And that is de novo creation of genes from, I put it here, quotes, junk DNA. And by junk, I only mean here uh, portions of non-coding sequence, right? Sequence that isn't coding for a protein and making a product that has some responsibility in the cell. And so how can you take a portion of code that doesn't seem to have any obvious responsibility and then suddenly make an active gene out of it, even a protein coding gene. So protein coding genes evolving from non-protein coding sequence. Um, and so this is rather than starting with a previous gene and switching its, uh, its job, that's promiscuous proteins, you switch the gene from doing one job to another over time, uh, or duplicating a gene and then recruiting a new function for the second copy. That's the second thing we looked at. Or horizontally transferring a portion of DNA uh, with, with um, the code already in place and then moving it into your cell. This is, I have some DNA, right? And I'm not using this portion of my DNA, at least for any important function at all. And I'm going to then form a protein coding sequence or some other element that actually regulates uh, other genes, and that's going to give me new functions that I no longer uh, that I didn't have before. Uh, there's a really interesting article, and I will probably do another video on this as well because I have a whole bunch of examples of, that, that we have now found of de, de novo creation of genes. Um, but this particular one by uh, Yona et al., random sequences rapidly evolve into de novo promoters. Um, it was a really fascinating study in the lab showing how uh, junk or non-coding sequence or non-usable sequence has been turned into something that performs functions uh, over a very short period of time. Okay, so there's our four different primary ways of innovating or adapting genetic information and changing it and giving it new properties over time. All right, I don't know, maybe you thought that was already uh, kind of over the top and uh, maybe too detailed, but we're gonna we're gonna get a little more detail now. So here's my my warning, right? Super geeky molecular genetic stuff is coming up. All right, so here's our example. Here's what we want to talk about today. We're gonna talk about amylase. So just picked out one gene, and we want to observe the I guess the history of this gene in mammals in particular. Uh, we'll talk about some specific mammals like human beings and dogs. Uh, but let's first start by talking about the gene itself. All right, so you have starch in your diet? Uh, chances are you do, right? And starch is a uh, polymer, meaning it's a rep, it's a, 
it's a continual series of the same uh, biomolecule over and over and over again. In this case, it's um, a sugar unit repeated over and over and over again. So when you eat starch, you're eating sugar, right? When you eat a uh, French fry, which is potato, potato is a storage organ for energy, and the energy is stored in the form of starch. And starch is just one sugar attached to another. I know starch doesn't taste like sugar, uh, but that's just because the particular molecular conformation of it, you don't taste it, but you are eating sugar. Now, how do you get the sugar out of starch? Well, you produce an enzyme. So you have a gene uh, encoded in your genome, and there are places in your body, particular cells in your body, particularly in your pancreas and in your saliva glands, where you turn this gene on, right? You don't use this gene in every place in your body because every place in your body is not going to see starch. Starch doesn't get into your finger cells. Um, it's going to be broken down into little bits and absorbed into your body well before that. So it's no longer starch once it gets to the rest of your body. So you don't need to use this gene. This gene is called amylase. And what it is, is it's a gene that has a code for making a protein. And that protein is an enzyme called amylase. And amylase's responsibility is, so here's your, here's your enzyme, uh, it facilitates the breaking apart of your starch. So it um, binds to, right, or joins to the starch molecule and it assists in breaking it into di, what are called disaccharides. Di would be two, so you have, and saccharin is sugar, so two little sugar units. And these little sugar units um, then are small enough that you're gonna be able to absorb those, and then you're gonna be able to take those in uh, in your cells, and you'll break them down further, right? And you'll release the energy from them. So you're gonna get that sugar high eventually, right? From eating a whole bunch of starch, it's because you're gonna you're gonna generate a whole bunch of blood glucose or sugars, and those then are gonna be absorbed by your cells, and you're gonna tear them open and with other enzymes and release the energy. So in order for you to use starch as an energy resource you have to break that starch down. If you can't break starch into pieces, these disaccharides, the starch molecule is thousands and thousands of sugar units long, and it's going to move through your intestines and right out the other end, and you won't have absorbed any of the energy from starch. So amylase is the enzyme that performs this function for you. So there's a gene, you have a code, right, that helps you perform this particular function. Now, what's intriguing about amylase is that you might have extra copies of this starch digesting enzyme or gene, amylase. So I might have one or two copies of the gene. You might have three or four copies of this particular gene. Um, there are differences among humans for the number of amylase genes we have and also differences in the number of genes that we have in terms of where they're expressed as well. So we have genetic variation for our amylase genes. Now, uh, just think with me for a moment really quick about what we're saying here. If there are differences between you have more genes than I do, let's say, you have more copies of that than I do, right? But we all share a common ancestor at some point. All right. Our common ancestor probably had a particular set of amylase genes, right? Some particular number of amylase genes, and and there are actually different forms of amylase genes. Um, but then the descendants, all right, of that common ancestor, have changed the number of amylase genes that you and I have. So. Um, some individuals have more or fewer, which means they have more genetic code or less genetic code than someone else. How did that happen? Right? It has to happen through some process, right? That's the process we're talking about, right? We're talking about how does new genetic information, novelty processes occur? And I'm going to show you that you actually gain some or lose some function uh, through this process. So here's a here's the first paper we're going to look at very quickly. Um, recurrent rearrangements of human amylase genes create multiple independent, and that CNV is copy uh, number variant series. Yeah, 
Uh, yeah, so Schwann et al. in the journal Human Mutation. All right, so looking at a variety of different human mutations. So right there, uh, you, you, they understand this to be a mutation, right? This change in the number of amylase genes is a form of mutation that has occurred uh, within humans. Um, let's read the abstract, and I'll try to explain the terms in the title here. All right, so the human amylase gene cluster Right, so there's actually multiple different genes, and there's two different types of amylase genes. You have the human salivary, right? That's AM, it's called AMY1, so amylase 1 gene. Uh, and human salivary gene, well, guess where that one's going to be turned on in you, right? That's going to be turned on in your salivary glands. That's the amylase you're producing when you chew, when you bite into something that has starch in it, you then make this amylase um, enzyme and excrete it into your saliva. And so then your saliva mixes with your food and it begins the process of digesting the starch right there in your mouth as you're chewing. And then as it goes down into your stomach and then it begin and it continues the process in your stomach and eventually it gets into your intestines. Well, guess where your digestive stuff comes from in your intestines? Well, your pancreas is producing enzymes that excrete into, into your uh, intestines and allow you to continue that digestion. So there is a amylase 2, what's called 2A, and there's an amylase 2B gene. These are two separate genes. Oh, let me, let me just, let's just draw this out here. I have another drawing in a moment, but... Uh, so you've got, let's say there's a, a code, right, for the sequence that makes amylase 1. And somewhere else there's a code for amylase 2A and there's amylase 2B. All right, so you have three separate genes in the simplest sense. Three different genes. Two of them are making this enzyme in your pancreas and one of them is making it in your salivary glands. Now I want to remind you, I want to remind everybody that, that if this doesn't mean that that gene exists in your salivary glands and then you don't have it in your pancreas. Yes, you have amylase 1A or 1, right? This gene right here, that's found in every single cell of your body. What we're indicating here, though, is that it doesn't turn on. That gene never turns on and expresses its code in your pancreas. It only expresses its code and makes a product in your salivary glands. Just like before I was saying, you don't make this enzyme in your finger because you don't need to. There's not gonna be any, there's not gonna be any starch there, so there's nothing to do. So why waste your time making uh, this product? All right, so it turns out the amylase 2A, 2B, and AM1 is highly variable because it's in a, what's called a very dynamic region of the genome an area where we see a lot of rearrangements and, and extensions or uh, contractions, so increases in sizes and decreases in sizes uh, through mutations. Copy number variation, that's what CNV stands for, of AMY1 has been implicated in human dietary adaption. All right, we're, this is this is kind of this is the thing that I think is really interesting. Uh, the reason we're going to talk about amylase. And in populations associated with obesity as well. But neither of these findings has been independently replicated. This article is a few years old, um, but it's still true that there's a lot of discussion and a lot of continued work to try to figure out the, the potential association with the number of copies you have of AMY1. And this is the one that is expressed in your salivary, uh, your salivary glands. And uh, the diet that you eat. Well, we recognize that there are people on earth that eat a huge amount of starch um, and live in societies where starch is the main food source. And there are other places in the world where starch is actually relatively uncommon uh, and not a large portion of, of a person's diet. Is there a relationship? Is there a correlation with the amount of starch that individuals eat and the number of copies they may have of the amylase one uh, version of this gene? After all, if you have more copies of the gene, you potentially have more expression of amylase, which means you make more amylase and you may be more amylase in your saliva. If you have more amylase in your saliva and you're, you're eating lots of starch, well, then you're going to break down a lot of starch. If you don't have much amylase production 
in your saliva, then you don't break down a lot of starch. So let's say you're eating a, a you know, huge amount of McDonald's uh, French fries and you only have one copy of your amylase one gene. Uh, that's going to go down into your stomach and it's not all going to get broken up into pieces. And then it's going to go into your intestines and it's going to continue to break down because you do have additional amylase um, uh, enzyme there. But even so, you've put down so much um, starch that you might not be able to digest it all, in which case it's going to pass through you. You'll get some of it out, but you don't get all of it out, as opposed to somebody else who might have more copies of their amylase 1 gene. They might express more of that enzyme in their mouth. So when they eat a gob of French fries, they actually break more of it down and they get more energy out of it. So there's a difference in our physiology right, between those two individuals because of the differences in the number of copies they have of this particular gene. This, this is a functional difference based on the number of genes. Uh, despite these, as I said, functional implications, the structural genomic basis of C of V, uh, the copy number variance, has only been uh, defined in detail very recently. All right, now that we're doing more genomes, we're starting to really take a close look at the variation across all of human diversity. Uh, so they are, what this paper does is they're going to do a really high resolution look at the copy numbers uh, and the organization of those copies in this particular area. And especially in sub-Saharan Africans. And so they find some really interesting complexity uh, in the various rearrangements that the genome has undergone. Um, and this last line here, these findings demonstrate recurrent involvement of the amylase gene region in genomic instability. This portion of the genome is constantly uh, shape-shifting, we'll say. Involved at least five independent rearrangements in the pancreatis amylase genes, AM12A and AM2B, then goes on to say that there are multiple different extensions or expansions of the AM1. So these genes are being duplicated and also duplicated genes are being lost uh, in other individuals. So there are changes uh, in populations for the number of genes. Now, I'm not gonna go through every detail on this particular slide. This figure gives just a, a snapshot of like two, var two possible variants that you might have, all right? You inherited a chromosome from one of your parents, right? And on that chromosome, you should have copies of your amylase cluster of genes. And, but you have two copies of your chromosomes, right? Because you have one from your mom, one from your dad. They might actually have different numbers of these genes. So you are a mixture of those two, right? You might have one parent gave you three copies of amylase uh, version, uh, amylase gene one. So here we go, amylase gene one, but it is three copies of it. And so here we go, amylase 1A, amylase 1B, amylase 1C, right? You've got three separate copies of this thing, which means you can make, potentially make a lot of amylase um, um, uh, enzyme in your saliva. And as opposed to, here's somebody who has only two copies, right? But this person has two copies of their amylase 2 in their, pan in their pancreas. So they have four copies total of amylase 2, of which there's two primary versions. And so why, why the different names 2B, 2A? Well, it's thought that amylase 2 had a duplication. So here's the green ones are the twos. So the green one gets copied, right? And the amylase 2A also gets copied. Well, where did, two, where did B and A come from? Well, originally it was just amylase 2 in some individual in the past. Well, it turns out all human beings have 2A and 2B. Um, and so even the common ancestor of, of humans would have had a 2A and a 2B. They already had two copies. And those two copies, though, have been copied again. Uh, but other primates only have one copy of amylase 2. All right, so anyway... This whole slide is just to show you that there is a lot of variation in our genomes between us. Uh, and the other thing I just want to point out really quickly here is that there are some ERVs in here. That stands for endogenous retrovirus. So there are sequences of retroviruses, which are uh, the, the more common name for these are, are something like jumping genes. 
right? They're able to splice themselves out of the genome and move themselves around. The fact that there are ERVs, ERV sequences, around the amylase genes suggest that this region of the genome is a place where the jumping gene is jumping out and jumping in. And this is one way that genes can get duplicated because in the process, I, I, I don't have time here to go through the whole process of how ERVs work, but I'll just say that ERV activity, right, re retrovirus activity, can result in the duplication of portions of genomes. And the fact that you see the ERV sequences here is usually an indicator, even if you didn't see it happen, right, because we haven't seen this, we're just looking at people's genomes today. The fact that those ERVs are there, very good evidence that this, these portions of the genome have been copied uh, in the not too recent past. All right, now I mentioned the, in the abstract, it mentioned about obesity and amylase uh, enzymes. And so this is just a really crude, simple diagram from an article by uh, Falci et al. from 2014, uh, in which there was the proposition that possibly low copy number of salivary amylase genes potentially predisposes a person to greater chances of having obesity. Uh, again, this has not been confirmed. This is more like a, a proposal, a hypothesis, uh, but it is demonstrating what I want to show you, which is that some individuals only have one copy. Other individuals have quite a number of copies. And you have to ask yourself, where did they get all those copies? Well, that's gene duplications, right? The gene has been duplicated over and over and over again. And because it's been duplicated, if they're all still functional, which they don't all have to be functional. Remember, I said one of the two options for a duplicated gene is it could lose its function. And then it just becomes part of your junk DNA. Um, I'm doing air quotes here. Um, the junk just becomes unusable or non-used portions of your genome. Um, some of these copies in some individuals. So if we sequenced a whole bunch of people and we found somebody, let's say I have four copies. I might find out that one of those has a mutation in it and it doesn't function anymore. That's, so this is non-functional sequence. I can see that it's an amylase protein, but it doesn't really have the right sequence to actually function as one. And so it's lost its function through mutation. However, I'm not really sweating that because I have other copies, right? And so I'm still able to produce amylase in my saliva. Um, so that's, that's the dynamic nature, though, um, of our genomes. All right, now that's the situation in human beings, but we wanna, we wanna broaden this out and we wanna talk about uh, amylase activity in other organisms. And the other thing that I haven't demonstrated or at least shown you an example of is how a gene that's been copied can take on new functions, All right? Here we had an example where there was a copy of a gene in the saliva that was expressed in the saliva and it gets copied. Okay, you see like, that actually is providing a new function. The new function is increased activity of, of, of amylase because you now have more of it. More of it means you, you know, one person can digest more than another person can. So that is technically additional function, but I have to admit that's not really very exciting, right? It's like, okay, so you can do more than somebody else can. That's not, it doesn't really feel like a new gene, right? That doesn't feel like a new trait. It's like, that's a function you already have. You just kind of change, you change the amplitude of that particular function. So let's, let's go out and let's look at dogs. All right, this is from the journal Animal Genetics um, by Arendt et al. Amylase activity is a show associated with AMY2B copy number in dogs. Implications for dog domestication, diet, and diabetes. Uh, again, looking at numbers of copies of this particular gene might actually influence the way the dog diet and their, uh, their propensity for maybe having uh, diabetes. And here's the important thing about this. This is what I, I think is pretty cool. Um, in domesticated dogs, no, oh, remember, domesticated dogs are just wolves, right? I think everybody agrees that domesticated dogs are derived from a source, which is the wolf species, all right? And so domesticated dogs are really a subset, all right? They're a subspecies of wolves. 
Uh, and then wolves are a type of canine. So you have coyotes and wolves, and then the, the most different type of canine would be, say, foxes. All right, so you have a family, uh, the canidae. Now, up here on the top, I've just drawn a simple uh, diagram of a portion of the genome of different canines. And so the basic genome of canines is that they have an amylase 2B gene. Um, and they just have one copy. All right. And, and you might wonder why now is it called one or something like that. Well, that just has to do with comparing to other organisms and the, and the particular where they think the origin of that gene is compared to other carnivores. Right. Don't have to worry about that. All you need to know is amylase 2B. They have a copy of a gene that makes amylase and it's expressed in their pancreas. All right, so in wolves, and in fact, all other canines, they only have one copy of this gene. And that gene is only turned on in the pancreas. It's not turned on in the saliva glands. Um, and you're always like, well, how do they turn that on? All right, that's complicated genetics, but in front of all genes, there are additional sequences. And these are binding sequences, uh, regulatory sequences. These are places where other proteins attach in particular tissues. So there's another gene somewhere that's making a product. That product then binds in front of this gene and tells the apparatus which is responsible for copying out the code and then expressing it, the, the translation process of expressing it into a protein. Uh, those codes for regulating this gene are right in this region, yeah, sometimes much farther up, but there's some important ones fairly close by. And they will be stimulated, they'll be regulated and turned on only in the pancreas, because that's the only place that the wolf actually needs to turn it on, and other canines. So wolf eats, right, they're carnivores. But they're not going around eating a whole lot of starch. There's not a lot of starch inside of animals. In fact, there's no starch inside of animals, right? We store our energy um, in our sugar in different ways, right? We make glycogen. We don't make starch. Uh, and glycogen is, is broken down by a different enzyme. So if you're a carnivore, you don't need to, you don't need to be eaten. Um, I mean, you don't need to break down a whole lot of starch. Now, all carnivores will get a little bit of starch in their diet. They're, gonna, they're going to eat a little bit of fruit or something else once in a while when they're desperate, right? So they're going to have a little starch. And they have this enzyme, and it produces a little bit of amylase in their intestines, and they can break down the small amount of starch that they have in their diet. Great. All right, then I'm showing that downstream from that gene, there's another gene, right? So we'll call it gene X. Doesn't matter what it is. It's not amylase. It's just the next gene in the genome on this chromosome, which is the blue bar. Now, let's look at domesticated dogs. Now, here's what's wild, right? We're saying that domesticated dogs came from wolves, right? They are canines. But all canines only have one copy of their amylase gene. Now, when you go in, and now that we've started to sequence dom different domesticated dogs, we realize that there are some domesticated dogs that only have, like, two copies of this gene but many have a lot more copies of this gene where did those copies come from it has to have been mutations right it has to have been something happened such that they copied the the this particular enzyme the protein code the code for this enzyme and now they've made multiple different copies of this particular gene why would they do that and how did that happen well, the why is pretty simple. There is a selectional pressure, all right? There is an environmental pressure for domesticated dogs to be able to um, digest starch, right? Because domesticated dogs have a lot more starch in their diet. Um, we tend to feed them food that has that is starchy, all right, or plant-based, you know, we, and we also have dog food that has starch in it. Uh, and so the first 
uh, domesticated dogs who are hanging around people are eating scraps of food from that people have prepared, right? And they're going to be high in uh, or higher in starchy type uh, substances. And so any mutation in any one of those original domesticated dogs in which they duplicate this gene and then because they duplicate it, if they duplicate it, well, the important thing about duplication is they have to duplicate this whole section that includes the regulatory element. So if they copy that whole section, so here we go, they copied this whole section. I should have put a little, like, let's say this is a little, my little orange bar here, right? Represents the regulatory region. I could have that here as well. It's got the same regulatory region. Now that you have two copies, you can make twice as much potentially at the same time. And so you, you potentially are making more amylase and expressing more of it. So you have more of it in your intestines so you can take advantage of that food. That's going to be an advantage for that particular dog because it's going to get a lot more energy out of its food. Prior to that, uh, uh, wolves, if you give them a whole bunch of starch, they don't really get a lot of energy out of it. It's like not very useful food to them because most of it's going to pass through again without getting digested. So there is a selectional we call it selection high selection pressure on animals that are eating a lot of starch or have the potential to eat a lot of starch for any of them that have an accidental mutation that copies this gene they're going to have a benefit in which case they are likely to be fairly fit in that particular environment they have more offspring and guess what happens when they have offspring they copy those two copies to their offspring creating more offspring that have more copies which are better adapted to eating a starchy diet. All right, now, but look what happened. This is, uh, this is more than just making more copies so they can just do more of the same thing. Canines don't produce amylase in their saliva. All right, so all the other canines, wolves, and it's been tested, wolves don't make amylase and they don't express it in their saliva. But domesticated dogs do. Now, how do they do that? How do they do that? It turns out they have extra copies of their gene that express in the pancreas, but they also have copies of the gene that are expressed in the saliva. And so they have additional copies that have somehow learned, all right, to be turned on in the saliva. It was like, like, how do they do that? Well, the gene itself is probably very similar. All right. In other words, the code is probably very similar to the original code of the original pancreatic am amylase. And that probably hasn't changed much. Maybe not at all. Um, what has changed is the regulatory region. So the portion of sequence in front of it. All right. If you change that sequence inside the saliva glands, there's a bunch of genes that are expressed there. Right. You're making a whole bunch of different enzymes there. They're helping digest your food. And um, they are looking, there's particular codes that bind to regions to find those particular sequences and say, like, here's the sequence you need to copy out because we need to make a product here, which is the enzyme. We need to make more of this in the saliva. If you have mutations to the regulatory elements, right, the DNA binding sites, the, the, the thing that finds your code and says, this is the code I want to use. And suddenly you have a mutation that then starts to turn that particular gene on in the saliva gland, right? That's going to give a big advantage to those dogs. Like that's a big advantage to be able to make saliva in your, to make uh, amylase in your saliva means you can start breaking down your starch much earlier and you're going to get a lot more out of it. And so the food is going to be, it's like you're getting a lot more food for the same amount of food you're eating compared to your friends who don't have that mutation and can't make any amylase in their saliva. And so that particular mutation is going to continue to get propagated in more offspring. And then, of course, they are going to have mutations. And some of those mutations will make that binding site stronger. And when it gets stronger, it begins to then make more amylase, right? Because uh, the amount of binding you have and the strength of that binding will often determine the amount of expression. And, and so that's another way you can change how you use your genes is not change the sequence of the gene, but you can change how you control the gene, how much you express it. Uh, in this case, what's happened with some domesticated dogs is they made a copy. All right. 
of the original amylase B, uh, two, this should have said two over here. They made a copy and then they made an, they probably had a mutation that gave it the ability to be produced in the saliva. And then this whole thing got copied again <laughs> and it already had the regulatory sequence because it got copied. And so it also is being expressed in the saliva, which then increases the amount of, of uh, amylase in the saliva. It got copied once again in some domesticated dogs, but after that they had another mutation that basically stopped the function of that particular one. So we call that a defective gene. That's a pseudo gene, all right, a fake gene at that point. It's lost function. So you have a combination of losses of function, but I won't, I'm going to call this, this is a gain of function, right? I mean, this is the definition of gain of function. Before this gene only expressed itself in the pancreas because it had particular sequences for regulatory elements that only turned it on in the pancreas in all canines. And domesticated dogs had a mutation that switched on a new switch, allowing the gene to be expressed in the saliva, uh, while at the same time also being able to express in the pancreas because they had a duplicated version. See, here's the problem. It's hard, to, it's hard to turn on in two different places at the same time with the same gene. It's easier to separate the functions into two separate genes, and then you're like, oh, you go do this in that particular tissue, and I'll do this in this other tissue. We're all present in every tissue, right? Every gene is present in every single cell, but they're only being used differently in different cells. This is a new function. Domesticated dogs have a function for amylase that doesn't exist in their, in their ancestors, right? They have come up with a new way to use amylase. Now you might say, that's not a new way. Human beings are doing it. Well, that's true, but it is definitely new for domesticated, uh, new for dogs. Um, or new for the canine group to be able to use the gene in their amylase. And if you look at the sequence level, they're not controlled, they're not turning it on with the exact same switch that you and I are turning it on with. So they have found a different way to express the gene in their saliva. All right, so domesticated dogs have shown that, I think very clearly we see um, given that everyone thinks domesticated dogs are a subset of wolves, clearly gene duplication happens, right? Oh, I forgot to show one thing. The little white boxes, these are ERVs, endogenous retroviruses, and the arrows represent the direction in which they are pointing because there's directionality to them in terms of how they insert. And the fact that they're uh, inserting in opposite directions the region between the two is the section that is copied. So endogenous retrovirus lifted out this copy and then copied itself again, copied itself again, copied itself again, and so forth. All right, so that's, that's the mechanism by which we can see that they have copied themselves. So copying happens, all right? Duplications happen. Those are a form of mutation because it's changing the code that existed before into a different genome in the descendant, right? It has additional DNA that the original uh, wolf didn't have. So it has new DNA and it's applying it to a new function and that is making and expressing this enzyme in the saliva. Now, can we see this anywhere else? Let's continue looking at amylase. Independent amylase gene copy number bursts correlated with dietary preferences in mammals. So let's broaden this out. We just looked at domesticated dogs. So this great figure in this, in this paper um, by Pajek uh, et al. in eLife Journal. Uh, here's your domesticated dogs right down here. And the bar, the, the, each individual box here represents copies of amylase. And so what it's indicating here is uh, Canis lupus uh, domesticus. So it, that suggests subspecies of Canis lupus. Canis lupus is the wolf. See here, the wolf only has one copy. Um, and also cats only have one copy of amylase gene. I mean, cats are highly carnivorous and they don't eat much... Uh, uh, starch at all. And the, the, 
this box right here that isn't quite as dark, that represents variation. So within the domesticated dogs, they don't all have the same number of amylase genes. So different domesticated breeds of dogs have different copy numbers of this particular gene. And so some are actually able to handle different amounts of starch in their diet. Uh, and so it's this kind of molecular biology and this kind of DNA sequencing that is actually leading to very specific diets, basically, that can be drawn up for different dog breeds if you know the number of copy numbers uh, in a particular dog breed. You can figure out, and the, the, the other thing about this paper was it's talking about diabetes, right? Some dogs may be more susceptible to diabetes because of the starch load versus their ability to digest it. And so if you manage and match starch load with their ability to digest, you might reduce the amount of diabetes in those particular breeds, All right? Molecular biology actually being used, right? <laughs> in the real world for, this isn't just a uh, theoretical stuff, right? Um, I, and so this just shows a variety of different mammals and it shows how many copies they have of the amylase gene. And so here we are, human beings, right? We've got gobs of them and we have lots of variation. Now, I'm going to be just a, a little bit too general here, but there is a general trend toward um, uh, Asians. Yeah, Asians having larger copy numbers of the amylase gene, and they have an enormous amount of starch in their diet. Now, you can always ask the question, which came first? It's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Uh, did people get a diet that had high starch? And then that was the selective pressure such that when they had mutations, those mutations, duplication mutations, when those duplications happened, they were then selected because there was such a big advantage to like, hey, I'm already eating a ton of, you know, starch. And the better I can do handling this starch load, uh, the better off I am. Um, other primates. Other primates do have multiple copies of amylase gene, but you know, other primates are omnivores, just like human beings are omnivores, and we do eat plants and animals, and plants have starch, and so it makes sense that omnivores will have more copies of the amylase gene. And you see down here, mice, uh, rabbits, and so forth, they also have variable numbers of amylase genes, so they've undergone duplications of it as well. Um, but then you see other animals that have much less are likely to eat starchy diets don't have it, except the horses. For some reason, horses, which eat a ton of starch, don't have extra copies of their amylase chain. So it's not a perfect correlation. But overall, more starch in your diet, more reason to have greater amounts of amylase genes. And so any duplication ends up being a benefit. Um, this figure, yeah, let's skip that figure. Let's just go to the last figure. So let's back up again. And let's just say, how does this happen? Um, here's a, here's two possible routes to becoming, um, better able to digest starch, right? The ancestral condition appears for all mammals is that all mammals have at least one gene for making amylase that gene is expressed in the pancreas in all animals, right? So that's a pancreatic enzyme that's excreted into the intestines. So that's the basic place where you're gonna digest starch. So here's what could happen. Lineage A, all right, lineage A, let's look at that one. One possible scenario would be you have a copy of this gene and it's the ancestral pancreatic version. The, the, the little yellow circle here represents um, the regulatory region. And in this case, we're saying the yellow is pancreatic specific. And so it's very, it was what's called strong. There's a strong connection there where there's a very specific sequence that is, and there's, a, there's something in the pancreatic cells that is turned on in pancreatic cells that makes a protein that binds this site and stimulates it to then activate that gene. It's like turns on that gene very, very strongly and says, you make a lot of amylase right here. And that strong relationship is not formed anywhere else in the body. So it's not turned on anywhere else. Um, you have many genes like this. They're only used in one specific type of tissue in your body and it's very tightly controlled. So what could happen is you could have a duplication of this entire thing. 
right? So you duplicate the entire set of sequence, not just the coding sequence, but also the regulatory region. So now you have two copies, in which case, what can you do? You can make even more. When you turn on one, you're probably turning on the other two. And so you're turning on both copies, you're expressing two sets of amylase proteins, and you have more amylase being produced and put into your intestines. And that could be a good thing for some organisms. Now, what might happen over time? So here we have our arrow saying, hey, time passes. As time passes, one of them will continue to maintain the same function. Doesn't matter which one. One of them maintains the same function in the pancreas because you need to do that. Maybe it's, it's important for the survival of the organism. But here's the thing, because you have two copies of the gene, it's not really necessary for both copies to be constantly functioning the same way. And so what you could have is you could have a mutation in the regulatory architecture. So you have a mutation that changes it so it's no longer specific to the pancreas. And now maybe you have a mutation that, that makes a strong connection to a regulatory protein that's already present in the saliva. That regulatory element is telling other genes to turn on, but now that you turn this regulatory element into the same as that regulatory element in the saliva, uh, and again, this, uh, that, those other paper, that paper I mentioned earlier about genes being promoters being uh, evolving from de novo, just from random sequence, these sequences uh, can happen just by chance. You have the right change, and all of a sudden, boom, it turns on in the saliva, uh, almost instantaneously. And what this scenario says is, what if you make the right mutation and you create a very strong association in the saliva. Well, then the saliva is going to produce a whole bunch of that particular enzyme. And so now you have this new function. You're making it in saliva as well. Uh, now, the other scenario, here's another way to get to the same endpoint. You could duplicate your amylase. Where am I at here? You, you take your amylase gene, you duplicate it. Now you have two copies in your pancreas that are being expressed in your pancreas. Now what you do is you have another mutation, but maybe it's a different mutation. This mutation uh, basically causes it to lose its ability to express in the pancreas. And then it is weakly attractive to a regulatory element in the, or regulatory uh, protein in the saliva. And by weakly, I mean, instead of this one, maybe it strongly binds. And so it says, you know, over a minute, we're going to make, uh, you know, a thousand copies of this particular sequence. But over here, this weakly binds. And so the whole regulatory network and the transcription apparatus is not as efficient. And so maybe it only makes 15 copies. So you don't make as much of the enzyme eventually. Then what happens is you might copy this entire unit, the weakly uh promoted salivary uh, specific expression and you copy it and now you have two copies well guess what now you're doing 30 copies per minute instead of 15 and then maybe you have another time where it copies again so now you have three copies of that gene and all three of them maybe all three of them are fairly weak at doing their job but when you combine them all together you actually have fairly strong amylase activity in the saliva that's another way to skin the cat right two different ways, you get the same functional product at the end. But one, you have to use three genes to get, the other one you can only use one gene to get. Now, of course, there's always the option of one of these that's weak has another mutation, another random mutation at some point in some individual later on down the line. And maybe that mutation causes it to become strongly associated. And now you don't even need the other genes. And maybe one of those has a mutation that it loses its function. Right? There's all kinds of options that can happen here. Another option would be one of these has a back mutation and it mutates back to becoming active in the pancreas. That can happen too. Right? The, 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 whole, the whole point of this is that genomes have a um, remarkable amount of flexibility sometimes. Um, this whole duplication process and then reassignment of jobs all right functions and these again as we were saying before this is a novel function if it adds a new ability to digest amylase in a new place in the body that didn't uh, happen before
There is one other possibility I want to mention, and that is all of these, we're still talking about amylase. We're still talking about making the same enzyme. The other thing that could happen, here, let me delete this ink. The other thing that can happen is you could have a mutation in the gene itself that then causes it to take on a slightly different function. So instead of um, metabolizing amylase, maybe there is another um, polysaccharide, large sugar type molecule in the environment that you can't uh, you can't necessarily utilize very well. And I'm gonna I'll make this up. I know that these two are not closely related in terms of biochemistry, but uh, cellulose is also a long string of sugar put together in a different conformation. What if you had a mutation and all of a sudden your enzyme took on a slightly different shape and now one of these copies is able to digest cellulose instead of amylase, right, or instead of starch? Um, cellulose is in cell walls and you and I can't digest cellulose. It goes right through us. That's, that's your fiber, right? Fiber is cellulose. Um, and most animals can't do that, right? Termites, uh, you might think, oh, well, termites can, um, can digest cellulose. Well, no, actually they have bacteria that live in their guts that do that for them because the bacteria have that particular enzyme. Um, you know, it's, it's a long shot, but you know, maybe there's just the right mutation occurs that then changes the conformation of the enzyme and it begins to digest cellulose. Oh boy, what a huge advantage that organism would have if it could bite down on plant material and it could actually digest the cell walls too. That would be a huge new food resource. Um, as I'm even saying that, I think I know why that hasn't happened because that enzyme would have to be very different and a single mutation wouldn't do it. But there are very similar molecules to starch. And in systems that have those similar molecules, you can't digest them because you don't have the right enzyme. But if you have small changes to this enzyme, they can then break down those other food sources. You gain function by now being able to digest a new food source that this particular lineage of organisms could never do before. And the only reason they can do it is because they duplicated that gene. They have other genes doing the same function and therefore in a way they can play around with their sequence and try out new functions. Uh, and it's natural selection behind that that is the thing that is trying things out, right? Natural selection is, hey, the environment is saying, hey, that mutation worked really well. Let's keep using that one in future offspring. Oh, this other mutation, that one really didn't work. But it's not so bad for you because you already have other copies, functioning copies, and so you just end up with a pseudogene, and that's what lots of organisms have. That's what you have. You have thousands of pseudogenes in you. Those are genes that are broken and no longer functioning. Um, and whatever function it was doing before wasn't so incredibly important that you had to have it, otherwise you wouldn't be here, right? Uh, and so you can see that right here on this screen. If one of these genes broke and you already have other copies then you have a pseudogene, but you're still alive. All right, and that's where we accumulate our pseudogenes from, is from gene families, which are duplicated versions of genes that have taken on many, many different functions and many copies of those functions. Okay, so what, did we, what do I think and I hope we've learned here? I've just briefly helped to identify some of the mechanisms by which new gene functions can arise in organisms, right? How, do new, how are new genes created? And I've explained how one of those mechanisms, gene duplication, can work. And I did that by showing you the amylase gene in human beings, dogs, and in mammals. And demonstrating that, or at least providing a, I think, a reasonable argument especially from the dogs, that duplication had to have happened and that reassignment of tasks has happened through mutations, right? Mutations have reassigned the task of making amylase from the pancreas to the salivary gland. And that is a new function in that organism compared to its ancestor. Um, it's not an earth-shaking, radically transformative new function. But imagine this is happening at hundreds of different locations, potentially in the genome, in a new environments, 
genes are being selected for new functions all the time, all over the place, and gradually new functions are developing such that the organism is gradually transforming itself to adapt to this new environment, just like domesticated dogs have transformed and adapted themselves to the new environment of living with humans with very, very different diets than they had before. And it literally has affected the organization and shape of their genome because of the change of diet that they've experienced. All right, thanks a lot. My name's Joel, uh, and I you know, love to talk about this molecular biology stuff, but I also do a lot of discussion of science and faith topics and photography and all the rest. There's my credentials, and I hope to talk a little bit more about um, mechanisms of how genomes are uh, adapt right to local environments um, through the reshaping of the genome over time with that we'll talk to you later bye bye